take on and lecture on. Um, yeah, what I'm going to pass around here, well, I don't have enough for everyone, but I think this is probably one of the key factors I want to talk about today for uh, this particular topic. And my topic today is, by the way, welcome, thanks for coming. Um, we, uh, we were wondering about uh, when to hold this meeting and uh, figured if we hold it in the afternoon, we could have gotten everybody out of the heat. But uh, it is a bit uh, of a problem today, we'll, we'll get by it, but uh, when I last used my projector, I packed the wrong uh, power supply. So uh, we're not going to use PowerPoint slides today, which could be good, or it could be horrible based on, I want to explain everything and I'm going to have to, oh wait a minute, where's my sock puppet? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, so we're gonna we're gonna move on. What I'm, what I'm talking about today are really aphids and alfalfa with a particular um, focus on the blue alfalfa aphid. Um, the handout I sent around is the common aphids in alfalfa in California. Uh, the key I really want to talk about is uh, we have really four main ones: the cowpea, the pea aphid, the blue aphid, and the spotted aphid. Everything but the pea aphid really is um, a concern because it injects a toxin that causes stunting in the plant and in some cases can actually go into the next cutting. The pea aphid then is one that really it just gets to, you know, can get in there and be a mess. But the pea aphid appears about the same time as the blue alfalfa aphid. And they're very similar in, in, in the way that they appear. And if you look at that, uh, look at that handout, the, the, the way you, dis, you distinguish them in the field is the pea aphid has bands. If I'm, if I'm correct, I'll check my notes here. Um, <laughs> has, you know, the pea aphid has the dark bands on the end of every segment of the antennae. And uh, the pictures you see are incredibly obvious. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult to see in the field, so it's worth getting collecting if you have any question. The reason is the, the threshold of the two of them are completely different. Where one requires um, uh, about uh, uh, at, at a very small stage, less than 10 inches of growth on the uh, on the uh, alfalfa, uh, it's, it's up to 40 for the pea aphid and 10 to 12. 10 to 20 on the, uh, the blue alfalfa aphid. So it's a really, real difference. Now one of the big things is this blue alfalfa aphid came about in 1970. It caused havoc for about three or four years or five years. Uh, it was absolutely out of control. Uh, and then a breeding program was put into place. We found host plant resistance and essentially got it back under control. Host plant resistance is our number one uh, management tool for it. And in rare cases, as has been for the last 30 years or so, uh, where you needed to apply a material, then uh, uh, we were able to control it with organophosphates and uh, pyrethroids. Usually at the time, we were beginning to think about managing weevils. So we tried to get in there and do both of them at the same time if we can. Something's happened in the last two years where this thing has really blown up in the field. And Dos Palos, Los Palos area is one of the areas where this has occurred. It occurred in 2013 and occurred again this year. It occurs, it has occurred, it's become a problem in the last, in the same two years, in Imperial, in Palo Verde Valley, in the high desert, and especially down in Kern County. It kind of jumped from Kern County, Southern Valley, up to here for some reason, which we don't really understand. However, in 2014, we saw it widespread uh, in between in Kings and Fresno counties as well. Um, the materials we were using didn't seem to be that effective. In the years past, for example, the cowpea aphid, if they had a mixed population of cowpea aphid and blue alfalfa aphid, cowpea aphid was cleaned up. We're talking lower's band, dimethylate, um, and then some combination perhaps with a pyrethroid, but primarily the organophosphates. Um, but when they noticed, first of all, high populations, and your PCA went out there to control it, you know, they, put the, they put the product out there, I've done for the last 10 years, and came back and said, wait a minute, this thing hasn't it been very effective. So they went into a whole period of just trying all sorts of things. And um, in 2013, we got it back under control, uh, the, but not before we saw a reduction in yield. We saw a reduction in, in the growth of the, of the plant through the second, up to the second cutting. The blue alfalfa aphid appears 
our, our, our information says late winter, early spring, February, this kind of a thing. Um, it's a cool weather aphid. So once it begins to warm up in April and May, it just drops out of the system. And you don't see it anymore, usually. Um, it also says that we don't see it in late fall and winter. And uh, what I'm finding this year was fields were treated in fall of 2013 down, I know for a fact, in Kings County, because they had, and, and also Kern County, because they had a beginning to build up. The thing that really struck us this year was how early it was. And it was one of the first finds was right up in this area here. And it was the middle of January when the PCA happened to notice. Um, you know, that field doesn't look quite right. I believe it was a seedling field. And the seedling fields were really badly affected this year. So we went out and looked at, you know, you've got a seedling plant that has about, a, you know, that much growth on it. And you've already got 50 or 60 acres on it. In fact, so heavy because, you know, it was a dry winter. We didn't get a rainfall. Irrigation hadn't occurred. The poor plants have fallen over from the weight of the acre. And most of the time, the PCAs aren't in the field in that time of year because there's, that's usually the you know, post-Christmas time and there's usually not a problem. Well, people start going around and looking, Kern County start reporting problems, and uh, that's when we got, uh, that's when we really realized that we had, uh, we had a really, really early um, outbreak. So almost everybody immediately began to, to work on it, began to hit hard, began to try to get it under control. I know places that had up to five applications, um, and these were not these were not soft applications. These were combinations in Curry County, you know, of lanate, of dimethoate, of Lorsban, and of a pyrethroid product. So I mean, it was some really heavy stuff that went out there. This year we didn't see, and I'll, I'll, I'd kind of like to open it up a little bit for some discussion too to see what you all saw, sort of post March or after March, uh, as to what you saw in terms of yield and, and, and after effect. But it seems like for the most part we got on top of it, and uh, and, and then once we could put some water on the, those fields, the alfalfa seemed to, to to recover fairly well. Another difference in 2014 was Stanislaus County had a huge outbreak. I think there was some reported last year, but this year um, there were people who were treating and treating. This was about February and March. Were treating and treating and treating five applications, and they were still getting clogged. So they demanded at that point that somebody, uh, you know, they've gone through all the products. We need something new. So uh, the Stanislaus Farm Supply, acting as a representative, worked closely with the Ag Commissioner in uh, San Joaquin County or Stanislaus County, pardon me, and worked with both uh, FMC and uh, Dow AgriSciences to try and get a Section 18 for Transform, a new product that's only registered, limited registration now, and Belief from FMC, which is equivalent to carbine and cotton. It's a flonicamid. This gives us a completely different mode of action. Um, there's already a 24C, I think it was, for seed alfalfa. And because of the way the seed alfalfa folks really needed it for ligus, they had built in there a 63 day PHI, pre, pre harvest interval. So most people are going, oh, of what value is that to us? I mean, 63 days to cutting. Well, if you could have had that product in mid, uh, in mid uh, January, easily that, about that many days from a first cutting. That would have been a great product to put into the, into the mix and be able to say that I'm out the way in the Moore's band uh, more toward the, toward the weevil season. So I'm going to just take a little break there. And Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about the 24C? Sure. If you could. This is Matt Rackerby from FMC. He's agreed to come in. Rather than me bundle up what, is the, uh, what the 24C is, just maybe take a minute to talk about what, uh, what, what, what they're doing. Cookies, good. Uh, the, the 24C that we have right now actually is being reformatted. Thank you. Uh, it's being reformatted. Um, in 48 hours, it should be on the CDMS system and the Agrian system, the recommendation writing system. So you'll have a, a, a usable uh, label that you can use. Currently, you actually can use a label. There's a letter from the state that says you can use this odd version, let's say. Um, 
Before I got here, did you go uh, through any of the PHAs or anything on, the, on what belief is? No, not that I'm aware. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd make a couple comments on the label and then a couple comments on how the product works and just maybe reminders for some of you. Uh, but for those of you that haven't worked with this chemistry before, some watch outs and a little education on it. Um, first of all, the label is going to allow two applications of 2.8 ounces, which is um, a common rate. should be a very effective rate. Um, it's, it's for alfalfa. And then the PHIs will vary. Okay, the PHI for uh, forage is 14 days. Okay, the PHI for hay, if you're going to cut it for hay, is 62 days. Okay, now we are working on that, but I don't want to promise you anything. You know. So, so what is the so what forage is what being chopped? If you want to run sheep in there, it's 14 okay. days. If you want to cut it and, and bale it for hay, it's 62. Okay. Um, so yeah, that is a long pre-harvest interval, but. When did your aphids come this year? It was January. And when did they come last year? We really noticed them around March. February, late February, March is really bad, right? Okay. okay. When's your first cutting in this area? April. Okay. So March, if they come late, it's pushing it. If they come earlier, you know, 30 days would be great if we could get that. 62 may be possible. And you're going to have to judge if it's, you know, what's worse, delaying a cutting or maybe, you know, Cut some junk off the first cutting and then really getting that second cutting um, under your belt nice and quick. Um, those are really the important label points. A couple things I want to point out, um, which is semi label related, but there are no bee statements on the label. It's an extremely safe product to bees. So that's a positive, especially with if by any chance we have almonds. And uh, maybe mid let's say if we get a shorter bee harvest interval later in the season, you're next to melons and bees are in the melons. So it's extremely safe to bees. Um, it's very uh, low uh, toxicity to, uh, to uh, beneficials has been noted in cotton and, and, and other crops that we're putting this, this chemistry into. So it's a good chemistry. But if you want dead bugs the next day, you're not going to get them. It causes them to quit feeding. There's a lot of you know the proboscis that pokes in, and, and, and you know basically it's their stylet that's sucking out all the good juices from the plant. Is uh, made in, in, in able to. It's not able to um, use it anymore. It's limp. You can't poke it into the leaf. So they stop feeding immediately. Maybe 15 minutes to half an hour of being treated. That's key to the product. Now, how long it'll take them to die depends on how hot the weather is. You know, if it's really hot, like today, a couple days they're desiccated because they can't drink. Um, more likely they might die of starvation in some other cases. So it's a slow death. Um, what I would recommend, if you put a treatment on, you're going in like a day or two after, look around and really slow down and look at some of those aphids because what they'll do is, there is some symptomology, and I've seen it only in the first couple of days after treatment, uh, where they're kicking their back legs out. It's like, have you ever seen a dog on your front lawn do his thing and then he starts to miss? Why would they do that? I don't know. But the ache would start kicking out with the back legs like that. I've seen this in cotton. So, it's so it's an odd, you know, little nature of the product. But, um, and then, uh, you'll see a general slowing down of the aphids. Okay, sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll be walking, it like they'll be irritated, they'll be wandering around. And uh, I was trying to explain it to some people that were used to imidacloprid. And I said, look, we're like, imidacloprid is like aphids on crack. They're like, okay? We're like aphids on Jack Daniels. Just kind of <laughs> slow, kind of staggery, slow. They're walking around with no purpose sometimes. But after a few more days, they just tend to lose all their energy, and you'll start seeing it die off. So you got to you got to kind of look at the pre-population and watch how the population is going downhill, and your beneficials being maintained will be very helpful in cleaning up any that maybe you didn't get coverage to. 
Uh, the second point I want to make is this product is translaminar, so good coverage is important. It gets through the leaf, but it doesn't translocate that much, at least in some of the tests we've done. We've, in cotton, for instance, that'll go maybe maybe 5% down the petiole. So it's not really a product that's going to move throughout the plant, but throughout the leaf it'll be fine. If you hit this side of the leaf, we'll get the other side. Uh, the label does tell you to go 20 gallons minimum by ground, and I think that's perfect. I, I, 20 to 30 gallons with good coverage and good pressure should get you coverage through your head. Any questions? <coughs> Most of it's going to go 10 now. By ground? Well, but 20 is what the label says. Quads, these guys can't go 20. 20 is what the label says, and good coverage is important. 10 may work, but you know that's that's how it's written. So. Air? Air. Yeah, yeah air is there. I think air is. I have to look at it again. I got the label back there. I'll tell you. It's on my iPad. Um, I want to say five, but if I'm incorrect, I'll, I'll note that. Um, any comments, Pete? Any questions? No. Um, one thing, uh, an advantage, you know, we're talking aphids here in this meeting, and I, I always say I haven't met an aphid this chemistry can't have. With proper, proper rate, proper coverage, we've done pretty good. But what, if you have a resident Lycus population <laughs> at the time, we're active on Lycus too. So it'll help bring some Lycus populations down in case you have a cotton or, you know, a Lycus sensitive crop next door. It's going to be called uh, Belief or Carbine? Belief. Belief. Alpha. Yeah, I believe. That's the same one in seed alfalfa. So. And you said 62 days. Damn, that's really not going to do us much good. I know. Well, for now, unless you get them in January and you've got to treat in January, that'll give you the time, I understand. But um, they're, they're working on 30 days. Working on it. But don't hold your breath. You know, I don't want to overpromise. I'd rather have you pleasantly surprised by that. And again, I uh, I really think that the way the problems we have this year, um, there were, there was a fit for that product even at 60 days. And there were places uh, that were mid January that was the application started in, and then again in the first of February, and then again in you know two weeks after that kind of thing, where it was just over and over again. And uh, so yeah, that's a that's a real drawback for anything beyond probably mid February, but. Or if this thing comes again next year, I'll continue the conversation about why, why it's coming apart. It might be happening. But yeah, and, and sometimes these pre-harvest intervals um, are based um, purely on the science that they have, and then they know that after that time, you know, if it's any shorter than that time period, the residue level is above acceptable. But sometimes they just slap something on there because they're not sure, and they know that's a safe zone. They haven't done, they haven't done the studies to really dial it in as close as they can. Well, it was done for seed alpha. Yeah. And that was perfectly fine for seed alpha to put sheep back out. Yeah. So getting the label quickly was yeah. probably more important. At least we got our foot in the door now because we've been trying to get something for the last couple of years. And what I had here, thanks, man, thanks a lot. Uh, what, I, what I had here, I had a slide to show you sort of how narrow we are in alfalfa with our, with our products. And uh, almost all of our products are either Carbami, or OP, or pyrethroid. We don't have any neonicotinoids, we don't have any of the new chemistry, well, the exception of worm stuff, but I'm talking about for aphids uh, in particular, weevil. So this in particular, if, you had, if it was available this year in January, we would have been able to put a brand new mode of action out there and at least put some, some different kind of pressure on it. But uh, alfalfa is, you know, and I, not speaking from any authority, but my understanding is because you've got to go through cutting, feeding the dairy, then looking at the milk, you know, that's a really expensive residue process, tolerance process. So that's why a lot of times you're saying, yeah, you know, and it's, it used to be this really low value crop too, but uh, things have changed this year for sure. So anyway, it's, it's a little bit of progress. Um, we did. Um, Dow AgroScience did put forth the Section 18 for Transform, another new, another chemistry, and DPR just absolutely refused it right now. Uh, they want to see, I think, they're waiting to see get more full label, label registrations before they, they allow it out. It's a, uh, it's another, uh, where, the, where the usual neonicotinoids are um, 4As, this will be a 4C, 
So it's a completely, it's a different mode of action than uh, the standard neonicotinoids like admire and centric in a sale. Um, but the question we've been, at, we've been having to ask is why do we have this problem after 30 years of no problem? And so there's, there, there's several things that immediately come up. One of them is, well, we can't, we can't spray them. They're not dying. The, the, the stuff isn't as effective anymore. Well, that's true that we had some problems, but it doesn't explain why we had such early outbreaks in places that we didn't have outbreaks the year before. Second, the, uh, the, the small plot trial that uh, Eric Natwick has been doing down at Imperial every year for the last many years, he puts on a really great replicated trial with a lot of different materials. And he was getting every, anywhere from 95 to 70% to control. So in his small plots, it seems to have worked. But when we get to the larger field where we're doing it by air and, we're, and, and we've got a lot of other complications, it's been a little bit less at least less effective than the, the products are less effective than they have been in the, in the past. So okay, so maybe there is some increased tolerance. I don't know. The dip test says no. His evidence says no. Um, I think it's a numbers game. I just think we got so many of them that if you get 90% control, you still got 10,000 out there. I think that's part of it. Um, why do we? Why are we getting in so early? Um, I think that has to play into the fact that I think it has to do with our our um, our dry winters. I think it has to do with uh, the warmer winter we had last year. It was uh, not real warm, but it was warmer than usual. Even though we had a little bit of a freeze period, this thing is a is a uh, um, low um, low temperature, moderate temperature kind of aphid. Um, I think the other thing is if it's a period earlier. I'm going to talk now about host plant resistance. People are saying, well. We must be losing our resistance in the host in the uh, in the alfalfa varieties. Well, I've seen data that says no, that's not the case for the five, last five years. Both conventional and Roundup ready have had really 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 good uh, um, resistance levels. But some papers published 30 years ago indicated that that uh, that resistance tolerance really doesn't kick in until after about 60 degrees average temperature day temperature. So if the aphids coming in earlier when it's a little cooler, then maybe it's just getting one more advantage. It's earlier than most of the natural enemies appear. We haven't, I don't think, had the amount of moisture we needed, the foggy days, the cool days, the foggy days where the fungus gets started. So I think there's some environmental things there. If we get a good wet year this next year, um, you know, maybe this thing will, um, will uh, begin to go back into the, into the same level it was. So, um, I did want to mention one thing about biocontrol, and I think that's, that's about all I have to say. And these are observations I made. Um, again, I'll, re I'll remind you that we, many, many of these fields were pounded, and pounded with really broad spectrum insecticides. And, and everyone was going, uh, yeah, you know, we're going to have worms, we're going to have everything coming out of the woodwork on these things. One of the things we noted, and we noticed it almost simultaneously in Kern County and up here, was that a small parasitic wasp, probably Lysophlebus, just came out in droves. So I was looking at the field, trying, because I'm trying to, I was collecting the aphids for possible molecular biology studies in, uh, in the near future. I'll cover that in just a second, because that's the, fourth, the third thing that people think it is, maybe it's a new biotype. But I, I was down on the ground in a small alfalfa trying to find some aphids and put them into a vial. And these midges were just flying all over them. What are they feeding on? And I looked more closely, and they were all parasitoids. They were unbelievable numbers. And everybody's commenting the same thing. Just unbelievable. They look like just swarms of, 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 of gnats that would get in your face. After all those harsh chemicals just came through it, and I, I've got a theory, but it's not worth sharing right now. At any rate, they really did come through it, and then they're attacking whatever's left over. Francisco walked in, and I, I was with Francisco in one of his fields, and it was a seed field, I think, that they didn't do much treating on. And I had a picture that absolutely, I mean, it was 100%. There were, there were lots and lots of aphids on it, and they were all brown. And this thing was just filled with this parasitoid. So the final thing I just want to bring up is some people are saying, well, maybe it's a new biotype. Well, that's always a possibility. A new biotype is some slight difference in the population that allows it to survive better, overcome parasitoids, overcome host plant resistance, whatever it happens to be. Um, there is a report 
two years ago out of Australia that they have the same species of blue alfalfa aphid that have, has overcome some of their plant host resistance in their alfalfa varieties. Um, so we don't know, we don't have any idea if that's the case here. That's why we're trying to collect aphids so that we can, we can preserve them, send them perhaps to Australia and have them squish out the DNA and the RNA and then figure out what it is or not yet. But for right now, you know, I don't think uh, that's, that's, the, that's the, you know, the top theory personally. I think, it's, I think we're just having some unique situations and I'm hoping that, uh, and coupled with the fact that uh, Florida's <coughs> Genetics International did report that they still have a high level of resistance in their plants, tells me that it's, it's a combination of other things. Um, I think what we did learn from it is, is we better get out in the field early. Uh, fields that tend to be stressed tend to have a higher population buildup on it, say, or at least more affected by it, but that we can manage it and manage, if we manage it, start managing it early. Um, I saw one field this year where an application was made about the middle of January by helicopter, but did not have overlap between the swaths, so there were every 50, 60 feet, it was untreated. That was recognized, and two weeks later, the whole field was treated again, and that took care of that. That took care of the population. I saw the field in Francisco in early March, and you can stand out there and you can see where every one of those places were that were treated. So that's two weeks worth of feeding in January that we're seeing the effect in March, and it's just it just struck me as you know pretty incredible. Um, this year, I also saw stand loss. Where the where the where the uh, plants were actually so so stressed, uh, this was on a good watered field. It was so stressed that it actually took up on the stand. So it's not something we want to mess with. It's we want to get it early. We want to get, stay on top of it. And hopefully, if it comes back early again next year, then we have at least another chemistry we can put in there. So I think I'm having to stop. Can I make a comment? Sure. You were talking about coverage earlier and you know, infestation early on. Uh, just a quick story on seed alfalfa and the leaf. Uh, the first year out, I had some pea seed alfalfa, people say, Matt, actually I called after about seven days. The key to this product is where you have a good and a key coming, like lettuce, like putting it on and then coming back to maybe 10 days later or so, I mean, another day you want to fill in the plant on the But in seed alfalfa, um, I called after the first shot, I was calling out and saying, hey, I love it. And this is more of a light thing than a thing, but I had a guy tell me, oh, uh, I'm in the hospital right now. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't need to And he goes, I go, what happened? Because I got ulcers. From what? From looking at all this belief. <laughs> what do you mean? This is not where he says, actually, he said, half of it looks pretty good, or about a tenth of it. The other fork was excellent, and then about, he said, about a fourth of my customers aren't going to make themselves. Because it was so slow and everyone out looking, and I saw a lot of babies. So, some spottiness the very first year. So, that winter, I talked to applicators, and test control advisors, anybody making any discussion about the alfalfa. Really emphasize coverage. It's so important with this. We think in seed alfalfa, it's going to be you know, tough in the leaves, you're going to have pods that are feeding on. It's made a big difference in, in the desert uh, uh, see alfalfa. So here, you know, I preached and preached and preached on there long. I had no comments but positive next year. I mean, you know, people were saying, well, I don't know why it just seems to work better this year. So my guess is that we can focus on coverage and where maybe a plane was trying to get away with five gallons, he, he went the full time. Uh, I just looked, looked up on the 24C and it does say 10 gallons for a um, hey. And it's probably going to be worth it. Pay a little bit. You could get a knock out there. Thank you. Thank you all for putting up with the fact that uh, I lost the power support. Those are great pictures.